This is the Barker Historical Museum, located 7 Day Street, Fredonia, New York, 14063. Today is April 26, 2001, and we are here with Mr. Frank Rizzo. Uh, Mr. Rizzo, when is your date of birth? My date of birth is 11-26-21. And your current address? 13 Middlesex Drive, Fredonia, New York. And the war in which you served? World War II. And the branch of service? I, I was in the United States Navy. And your highest rank? Radio men, second class. Um, well, Mr. Rizzo, why don't you start telling us um, about how, you, when and how you became enlisted in the service? Well, I was working at the steel plant after graduating from, from Dunkirk High School. And then Pearl Harbor Day, December 7, 1941, gave us a clue what was going to happen. I was called in to, to register for the draft, but rather than wait for the draft, I enlisted as of uh, July 6th, 1942. I was sent from Buffalo, New York, where I enlisted. I was sent to Sampson, New York, where I did my early training. At that time, he also gave me a test of field to see what I was qualified for. And since I had learned typing in school, I was able to pass the radioman test, and they sent me to New York City, where I was joined a, a radioman school. Mm -hmm. I stayed there for about two or three months, and then I was I, I was put aboard a, a ship, an LST, landing ship tanks, and we were wondering what that meant. But it, but they told us it meant that this type of ship would land on the beach because in the in the hold would be troops, tanks, and trucks. And when we landed on the beach, the front would open up with two large doors and everything would, would uh, disembark. And then, so we had to wait until, um, until our ship was built. And then from, from New York City, they transferred me to Little Creek, Virginia, where the ship was being built in Virginia. About October 1942, I, joined, I, I went aboard ship, and, and then in due time we crossed the Atlantic over to Africa. We went to Missouri, Africa. We were getting there just as the capture of, of Africa was, was being returned to the Allies. After, the, after things settled down, we started to, to prepare for the invasion of Sicily. The invasion of Sicily took place in April of 1943, and it was a very successful one, and things didn't happen. But there was something very, very strange that happened. The first person that I met, I, I, I went to the beach because I was already men and I was one of these instructors. The first person I met, there was a boy about 12 years old, and he asked me for food. I said, who are you? Where's your past? He broke out a card, and his name was Joe Rizzo. Oh. I said, are you sure that? He says, I'm sure, because Rizzo over here is a very common name, just like Jones is, is over in your country. And he spoke English better than I spoke Italian. <laughs> and, and then after the, the invasion of Sicily, we, we, we returned to our base, because we used to go back and forth carrying troops, tanks, and supplies. And we were preparing for the invasion of Italy. The invasion of Italy happened September 9th, 1943, and it was at that time, as we were making our landing, that the Germans were firing at us with their 88s. We were hit several times with, with the shells, and I happened to get hit with, 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 uh, with some shrapnel. After things settled down, and, and something else that amazed me, we would unload the troops, tanks, and trucks, and we would loan prisoners of war and bring them back to Africa. Germans, there were two or three hundred Germans in our ship when we used to go back to Africa. I was, I was amazed that, that we were so involved in, in, in this type of, a, of an action. But in due time, Salerno became Italy and, and that became an allied uh, province, so to speak. And then we were told that the next step is going to be D-Day the invasion of France, where we will take over the Germans. 
about November we were sent to Falmouth, England, where we started to prepare for the invasion of France. And we waited, we, we did all the work and, you know, listened to the thing. It became very routine after, after two invasions. And on December, we were told the invasion would be December 6th. But after we were told that, nobody was allowed any leave because <laughs> they didn't want anything to, to probably, you know, probably leak out. Right. And it was, at first it was scheduled for two days before that, but because there was real rough and real weather, they transferred the date to, to June 6, 1944. And, and on June 6, 1944, we made a landing about oh, seven or eight, eight o'clock in the morning on Omaha Beach. And that's when we started uh, transporting men, tanks, and supplies so that, so, they, so that the soldiers could do what they were supposed to do. But it was, it was a terrible battle because there was a, the Navy ship behind us were firing and the, and the Germans were firing back and forth. So, so we, could, we could hear those shells going overhead and I said, thank God we could hear them because if you don't hear them, you're going to have problems. But in due time, the, the, the Allies took enough land so they were able to push the Germans back and, and in due time the Germans had to, had to surrender. So then the, then the Navy had, to, had what is known as, a, if you had enough points, you could be transferred into, a, in, into another base. I had enough points, so I, was trans I asked for my transfer. They sent me to New, New York City. And then they said, now we're going to get, prepare you for, for the big one, the invasion of Japan. And they shipped me to uh, San Diego. And it was the same story again, getting ready, getting shocked up for the, for the invasion, and, and getting us heat up psychologically because we were all concerned about how the Japanese would, would probably fight to the nth, nth degree. And then in August, President Truman okayed the dropping of the uh, nuclear bombs. There were two of them, which caused a tremendous number of deaths. And within four or five days after the second bombing, the Japanese uh, surrendered. On August 14th, 1944, they surrendered. So after that, it was just a uh, just, just marking time until until we could uh, be processed for for uh, sending us home. In, in, in due time, uh, my my uh, let's see, my discharge time was December twentieth, nineteen forty-five, and I spent three and a half years with, with the Navy. What was your most vivid memory when you were serving? Well, I think the first one was uh, when they were firing at us at, at the Battle of Salerno, <laughs> because there was our ships were firing at them; they were firing at. Uh, and you could hear the you could hear the shells and see the explosions and airplanes dropping bombs and uh, it was just the, the kind of uh, scene that you would see in a movie, but you never thought that you would do, be part of it. But it was a very visual one. And and then when that then when we finally got hit a couple of times with the 88s and one of my friends got hit and was killed, it made a tremendous impression on me. But I said, well. Huh? It could have been me, but in due time it was all over with. But uh, as you say, the food was fairly good. It was just routine, but it was, there was always somebody there preparing it. And, and a board ship, you, you ate two meals at least, and sometimes three meals, just depending upon the circumstances that you were under. But other than that, things were nice. and. And we had a very, very good captain, and, and he knew what he was doing. It was just wonderful. See, my job uh, on an invasion, because I was a radio man, used to be up in the folks, right up in the front of the boat, because I was supposed to keep in contact with the beach master. So when he told me things were ready to, to land, I, I had to convey that message to the, to the captain, and then he would take over. But at that time, I would. I didn't realize how important it was, but but everybody's job was important, especially during the time of war. The um, did you have to when you would land and be on the beach? Would you have to carry the radio around to communicate? No, my job was just to make sure the ship 
landed properly. After oh. that, it, it was over. Oh, okay, so you didn't have to carry it No, I didn't have to. And then, and then I became curious and I, I would walk around and see how things were going. And I, know, I know the first time that I went on onto the, uh, on, onto the Omaha beach, there were a lot of dead soldiers. I couldn't believe it. I told myself I wouldn't be able to do it. But, but it was a very vivid thing to see that. A lot of young, a lot of young, a lot of young men didn't make it, but that's the way war is. It's either him or us. Very, very tragic. Did you make a lot of friends? Well, most of the friends I know are, are passing on already because, you know, they would be in their 70s now, and if they're lucky, they could, like me, they could be in their 80s. But just have to be patient one day at a time. Because I used to send cards out, and then, you, then they'd come back and say, so and so is deceased. Oh. But all you can do is hope for the best one day at a time. And then after the war, uh, I remember being told about the GI Bill of Rights. So I was discharged in, uh, on December 20th, and by October of, uh, of 46, I was a freshman at the University of Buffalo. And, and by the year, uh, in June 1950, I had my master's degree. You know, and then I went out and got a job as, first as a social worker and then as a teacher. And, and I taught in Niagara Falls from uh, 52 until 84, then I retired. Wow. Um, what was it like when you came back? I mean, after... Very, very hectic. You know, I was wondering, what am I going to do now? December 20th, I got... But lo and behold, I went out to the, you know, to the steel plant, the Allegheny Lebanon steel plant, and I, I introduced myself. The next day, I was on the job. I was so lucky because, you know, things were so different there and uh, it seemed so hectic, you know. All they, you know, all they told me about, well, well, we couldn't have butter, we couldn't have this, we couldn't have that, but everything was going to the, uh, to the armed forces, but I said, well, that's the way things are, but, but things will level off. So I went to work for, for a while and then I thought, uh, well, maybe I should take advantage of this GI Bill of Rights. So, I, I spoke to my girlfriend and then September 2nd, 1945, we got married and, and I went to college and she went to work. <laughs> um, do you mind telling us a little bit more about your injury? Well, it wasn't a very serious injury. I got hit in the back because I was standing towards the folks and, and, and Michelle apparently went behind me and, and struck the uh, it struck the gun turret, and and the explosion caused uh, a large series of fragments of steel, and I got hit in the back with the steel. And I, I remember the doctor telling me, if if you weren't heavy, you'd have been you'd have had a, a terrible back injury because it, it almost hit your backbone. But because oh. I was a little heavier, it it, it stopped the uh, the fragment of steel. So I was lucky. But then when I got back into, uh, into the United States, they, uh, they called me down into the hospital and, and, and the Admiral there gave me my Pearl Heart, my Purple Heart. And I, so I thought, well, that's the way life is. But a lot of people have Purple Heart. What are you gonna do? So I was just lucky that it, that it was hit me where where it didn't do too much damage, just a lot of blood, that's all. Mm -hmm. What was um, the weather like in Africa, in Morocco? Beautiful, that's beautiful. It's like uh, we have in, in uh, September, June and September. It's warm, dry, really nice. I really enjoyed it. 
and even even during the winter months, you know, it's it was fairly nice because we were fairly close to the Sahara Desert. You know, Morocco was fairly close there. It's just on the on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. But it was really nice. Where did you like um, best? You know, did you like Morocco best or Italy or France? I think that, or? I think England because everything there. They spoke English and, and everything seemed so nice there. See, we're uh, and in Morocco was kind of uh, foreign language, and in Italy, uh, even though uh, I'm Italian, I didn't understand their language, and then uh, Sicily was the same thing. So when we got to England, everybody spoke English, even though they had a you know different accent, but at least we knew what they were talking about. <laughs> Um, what about music during that time? Did you have a favorite song? No, I really didn't. Uh, I'm not that oriented towards it. After I got back, I mean, people would tell me, better enjoy the music because you never know. So, 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 when, uh, so when there was that nice music by these different orchestra leaders, I enjoyed it. Hmm. What about... Um what did you do for entertainment? Did you have any time to for entertainment? Not a heck of a lot of time because what they were doing is they were keeping us oriented towards step one, which was the first invasion, step two, and, and, and you always had to be ready for it because you never knew when it was going to happen. The only time I knew it was going to happen was when they told us about the one in France, and then they told us to keep our mouth shut in effect by, by saying all leaves are canceled, no more leave it all. But, but I remember once when we were taking some uh, uh, some soldiers aboard, somebody says, anybody from Dunkirk, Fredonia? And, and I met somebody from Dunkirk in front of me, but I can't remember his name. Oh. I was so amazed because, you know, Dunkirk and Fredonia are such small areas. That, well, maybe we'll go through the list of names of people who are signed up for interviews and maybe... Well, you never know, that's right. <laughs> um, tell us about the service awards um, that you've been given. Well, when you're involved in these different invasions, you automatically become uh, an awardee for... When we went to Africa, that automatically placed me in the in the African invasion, went to Sicily, it automatically become uh, there in Salerno and France. So I have four battle stars, and that's what they gave us for each one. And I know uh, when I got my Purple Heart, uh, about two or three weeks later, I received the, the uh, conspicuous service call uh, uh, mail from the uh, from, the, uh, from the government of the state of New York. I, I don't know whether that was automatically done or what, but I remember uh, receiving a letter from my mother that says, boy, I was so surprised when I, when I opened the door after a knock and there was somebody from the, from the service saying that you got hurt. And then I was so glad to hear him just got hurt and that you weren't killed. But what are you going to do? <coughs> Did, um did you ever feel that you had sort of any, um, I know that they prepare you for it, but did you feel that after you came back to the States, did you sort of have any um, flashbacks or nightmares or anything? I mean, did it haunt you or, or were you able to make a, a smooth transition? No, for a while there, you know, it, it, it's hard to make that step uh, over into the quiet. I mean, there's always, a, especially at night, and, it, it, uh, uh, when you hear airplanes are going overhead, that's the first thing. Uh, is it German? What is it? And, uh, <laughs> it took me a little time to get over the fact about these uh, planes flying overhead, because to me, whenever I was over there, uh, most of the time it was a German plane or an American plane, but but I always had to make sure it was the right one, because for a while the Germans were very very dominant, but time took care of them. But I was lucky. I I didn't meet any Japanese. 
And I can always, that's the one, that's the one present I can always remember so, so vividly. But that's the way life is, one, one day at a time. Um, do you have any other memories you want to share with us? Anything that we didn't cover or? No, mine was just a routine service life. Uh, nothing really exciting except they were making those invasions and then they prepared us physically and emotionally for these things and they told us what could happen, what might happen, and so you were really prepared because that's one thing about the Navy, they, they really knew what they were doing and, uh, and this was a new type ship because this is the first time that the LSTs were, uh, were being used and I remember my number so vividly, LST-315. <laughs> and every time 315, you know, that always always rings the bell for me, 315. And as soon as I hear 315, the first thing I think about is the LST and, and some of the sailors that were aboard it. But unfortunately, time takes care of everything. But you still remember your serial number, don't you? Well, to, to me it was very, very important because they don't call you by name, but you have a number. And it's like the social security number. That's a very important number, and you, should, and you shouldn't give it to anybody, but who knows what happens nowadays on the internet and that. But as I used to tell them, tell them in school, there's only four or five numbers that you've got to remember. Your, your address, your phone number, and your uh, social security number. And then number four, your birth date. And if you got those four down, you're going to be real secure. Because people will be asking you, when were you born? What's this? What's that? And, and part of your education is to you know these things. Not just book work, but be practical to know what things are happening. Did you, did you let your wartime experience shape your classes? Or your, what you taught in school? Or how you handled or dealt with the students? Well, I think uh, in social studies, when we were teaching about in Europe, I, I tell them, well, I was there, so I, I, I can tell you firsthand as to, as, to, as to how things were at that time. Things have probably changed a great deal now, but because it's, uh, time goes by and, and everything changes a little bit. But first, it's the, the word, and then if you have any visual memories, and then it's, it becomes clear to you because everybody can read about it, but, but the important thing is to see it and to appreciate it. Hmm. You did let your students know then that you oh, served. Oh, yes. You didn't hide it from no, them. No, no. I, I was proud of the fact that I served. Yeah, and probably more proud because I, was able, I survived it. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I know uh, my friend. A neighbor and I, we both joined the, the Navy in the same day. And him, I was shipped off to Samson, he was shipped off to the armed guard for the, for the merchant marine. His first ship uh, across the Atlantic Ocean was his last. Hmm. His ship was struck by a submarine torpedo and he was killed. So he was in the service just a very, very short time. But Unfortunate. Does his family still live in the area? No, they're gone. Okay. They're gone. Time takes care of everything, you know. See, he was uh, 21 when he joined, so so they were in their 30s and 40s, so that would make them a little bit too old right now. Yeah. But what are you going to do? And you were how old? I was, I was born in 21 and I joined in 42, so I was 21, 20 and a half years. That's pretty young. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you remember right, everybody had to go down and sign up for the draft. And if you were single, they wanted you right away. So, And I, I couldn't see myself going into the Army. I don't know why. I just, so I, I, I picked the Navy and they accepted me. Did you... Did you mentioned your girlfriend who became your wife. Mm -hmm. Did you have her as your girlfriend while you were serving? Or did you yes, sir. I, 
when my cousin got married, that's when I met him. And, and, and so he got married in 1939. So I knew her from 39 and up until. So we've been married now since uh, 45, September 2nd, 45. So we got quite a few years behind us. Did you get a lot of letters from her while you were serving? Oh, yes. Yeah. Did you look forward to those? Or? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, there was something, you know, kept me, kept me tied up to the, to the real world, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get letters from family members as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, the, but they used to come in, in, in groups, you know, uh, five, six, seven at a time. And, and then if you weren't uh, if you weren't on a base, then you didn't get any mail for a while. Mm -hmm. But when you returned to the base, they would wait for you. Did um, did they mention the letters what they were doing here in the Dunkirk Fredonia area? Oh, they used to send me clippings out of the newspaper. Oh yeah. And you know, and you know how the Dunkirk Evening Observer is that sometimes it's very very uh, positive, and other times it's kind of negative. Yeah, especially, the, uh, I remember one when they were saying, no more, we can't get any more Oreo or butter, everything is going to the service. And, but I said, just be patient, it'll be over with in due time. But it was interesting. Did they have like victory gardens as well? And did, I guess, because I, I haven't found much information of what happened here at the time. Were women working in the steel plants and as well? Or I wouldn't know because when I came back, uh, when I went back in the service in, in January, there was a men there, a few men. But nothing in the letters to indicate. No, but uh, but there was a lot of talk about women taking over for uh, where where the men were were gone, so they had to be replaced. Yeah. I was wondering how much it happened here. You know. I really couldn't tell you the men. It's hard to believe it's gone. It's 55 years already. Oh. Do you belong to one of the American Legion posts? No, I don't. I was going to join them. I just haven't joined them. Mm -hmm. See, the one that I, th I thought about was the one down on uh, Lake Shore Drive, Frank Acrabia, mm -hmm. because he and I were pretty good friends. And then he was killed. He was a prisoner of war. Very interesting. And then there's well, uh, well, there are quite a few. Uh, you see, or well, well, the American Legion. Well, there's quite a few. Uh, just a matter of time. Do you want to show your um, service awards and your? You had said your discharge papers are in yeah. here. And yeah. your passport, you said. Well. That was the one they they issued me when I when I first joined the service, and this is the one they gave me when I left the service. <laughs> and these are the medals I obtained from three and a half years of service. And how old are you in that picture? Uh, let's see. Uh, nineteen twenty one to nineteen forty two. So somewhere around. Anywhere 21 to 42 would only be about 21, 21 and a half years old. So somewhere in there? Yeah. What's in the lower corner? United States Navy. This is a certified uh, Frank A. Rizzo, rating in second class, USNR, United States Naval Reserve. Huh. They make sure that the that you know who you are and you know where you belong, so <laughs> just in case you carry it. Hey, well, I'm not one of those that go out and drink, so I, I didn't have to show it around. Now I see your purple heart in there. What's next to it? There's your this one? Yeah. That's the uh, Conspicuous Service Award from the governor. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones from Africa, Sicily, Italy, and France. And then at the bottom are the things you will need used to wear on the, uh, on the uniform. Did the different colors on the ribbons mean anything? Well, they just uh, identified the different areas. Oh. See? 
Do you remember which ones were for which one? No, I haven't looked at them for a while. But... Yeah. I couldn't tell you. Okay. That's no. fine. No, without reading I, it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no. <laughs> what about what is next to your conspicuous award? It's silver? That would be on this the one? Right. Yeah. That's my ID tag. Oh. It's made of uh, stainless steel. And it's got the, my social security, my service number on there, and my uh, blood type, just in, if I ever needed any blood. What blood type were you? O. O, o positive. Yeah, everybody had an O, it seemed. <laughs> you know? So you say, Rizzo Frank A, 608-2505, my Technoshop, 842. USNR dash zero. That's my blood type. So in the event that I got killed, there's my identification there. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just as bright as today as it was when I received it. Oh. Made from stainless steel. Did it make it an Allegheny Ludlow? I, I you know, often wonder, but, but I thought it was real nice that they were able to do that, that, that they did do that. Yeah. So I think I got three of those. Not that I need them at all, but nobody else cares about them anyway but me. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. but, um, what about, what's that um, next to your like passport? There's like a bar there. Right, up, where? Up, uh, right next to your passport. Picture. Right here? No, up. This? <laughs> no. Um, oh, over here? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an identification tag. Oh. Different. Yeah, now you put it on your wrist. Oh. Uh, but, but, uh, but one of the uh, chain links broke, so I thought maybe I'll just keep that part of it. Ah. Well, there's, they want to make sure that that, uh, that if something does happen to you, at least they know who you are. So you had the dog tags and you had the wrist? Yeah, and the dog tag and the wrist. Oh. My mother said, that, you know. Oh. Uh, she had it engraved at the jewelers and sent it to me, but... Oh, so, so I, that wasn't like... No, no, this was an issue by the Navy. This is the one that was issued by the Navy. But you wore both. Yeah, well, just in case. I used to tell my mother, if I ever fell overboard or on, I would have to sink to the bottom. <laughs> because it was a heavy silver one. <laughs> now, who were your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Leonard Grizzle, 708 Main Street, Dunkirk, New York. Oh. What did your parents do? My father worked at the uh, Allegheny Ludlow, and my mother took care of ten kids. Oh. You had ten brothers and sisters? Yep. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And I was the first one to join the service. And my brother John joined the service, too. My brother Sam. Sam is gone. Yeah. This takes time. Were you the oldest? No, I was number four. Oh. Four out of ten. Yeah. When um, were your parents from Italy, or yes, they, they, they came over from Italy? Yeah. My father came over in 1905. I don't know when my mother came over. And your Italian wasn't that good, huh? No, no. <laughs> my father was a very you're here in America, learn to speak English. Oh. So, so he was able to speak both. But I used to, I used to remember some of the Italian language, but some of the words I knew, but, you know, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to converse in it at all. It's just because I've done so much local history, and I grew up here, and I grew up in Little Italy and Fredonia, I always find that somewhat interesting to, to hear. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, can you think of any questions to ask? Mm -hmm. Well, if you remember anything, yes. call me up and I'll write it down yeah. and send it to I think we covered it on most of the stuff I remember. Okay. I just remember the highlights and, and the in between. The, it's hard to remember those things. Um, if there's one thing that you could say, because there's going to be a lot of students and researchers who look at these videos mm -hmm. at the Library of Congress, if there's one thing that you could tell them about war and 
and what you thought about it, what would that be? Well, I was proud to be an American at that time, and I served three and a half years in the Navy, and, and Uncle Sam was very grateful to me, even though uh, I was working with him. He thanked me many times for, for, all, for all my efforts and, and, and my strong work, just to make it become a victory for, for the United States. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.